Let's just quickly pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Mark's gospel. And thank you, Father, that you speak to us. You're a God who's not silent. So, Father, we pray for your spirit to speak to our hearts, give us soft hearts, and give us open ears to hear you and what your spirit says. Amen. Oh, that's the series we're in, Christianity Explored. The title of the sermon this morning, Who Can Forgive Sins? And as you'll see as I go through the series, Mark's Gospel is structured around a number of questions. Um, and uh, we will see that in a couple of weeks <clears throat> when I preach the famous passage, Who Do You Say I Am? You know that great confession in Mark's Gospel. Um, couldn't find a photo of Jenny's dad offhand, but Jenny's dad was extremely interested in photography, film, and reels. We've got all these uh, photos and slides, uh, little things. Uh, and Jenny used to help her dad develop these pictures in the dark room. Many of you might not even know what I'm talking about this morning. What do you mean, develop a picture in a dark room? Where you put a negative and, and you'd put it in and put the solution there and it would slowly, gradually, from just a vague sort of thing, become this vibrant, clear picture. And then you'd pull it out of that and put a peg on the line. Have you ever seen that? It might have taken you back somewhere, another distant time. Um, and that was called developing Photography or photo, and same with film. Film was another thing that he was interested in, the reels and all that. Um, and that was interesting, trying to get those reels working, let me tell you. Uh, lots of fun. Um, and so, that is what is going to happen today as Mark develops a picture of the Kingdom of God. Slowly and gradually, we're going to see a, clear, a clearer and clearer picture of what the Kingdom of of God looks like, a developing picture of the kingdom of God. And, of course, Jesus has already introduced that theme of the kingdom of God uh, last week. Um, but to be honest, it's going to take to the end of Mark's gospel to see um, exactly what the kingdom looks like and what it means for you and me. But we're going to see enough today in that passage. We're not going to touch on all of those things, but... We're going to see enough today to see that this kingdom is an extraordinary kingdom and something we wouldn't want to miss out on. Seriously. I'm going to take you back to Jesus' uh, first words in the gospel, uh, his statement in verse 14 of chapter 1. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. <clears throat> As I said last week, uh, it's the first time Jesus has spoken in Mark's gospel, and the words Mark has chosen are really significant, and they set the tone for the rest of this passage uh, and the events that follow. First mention, as I said, of the kingdom of God, and the first time God uh, God, Jesus speaks about the kingdom, even though it's kind of vague, isn't it? You know, the kingdom of God is near. What do you mean? Kind of vague, isn't it? <clears throat> um, but in fact, he also says in later, in other Gospels, that kingdom has come. And of course, we know it has come in the person of Jesus himself. Point one, if you're following Glimpses or snippets of the kingdom. Um, it's a little <clears throat> like uh, boarding at the airport, where your flight is is ready and they give you the boarding call. Uh, you can, you know, you see there, you hear, and, and of course names are being called. If you're that late, you know, I've never been that late, but I've heard names. Uh, you know. Uh, Emily Lopez, please come to the <laughs> to the boarding gate, boarding gate 70, your, your flight's about to leave, that sort of thing. And it's with staggering authority that Jesus begins to call people to his kingdom, to leave everything and follow him. 
And we see that in verses 16 to 18. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I'll send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. I want to point out to you this morning that it's not an excuse me. Please, uh, sorry for interrupting you. Um, would you mind just coming and following? You know, I'm doing a bit of a mission. I know you're busy, but, but no. It is a demand on their soul. It's an irresistible call of grace from God that Jesus is announcing here to Andrew and Simon. And it actually, I don't know, I know you've felt that. If, you, if you've been called of Christ, it's an irresistible call that's given to you. You can't refuse it. You've got to obey. You've just got to, like that, they just lift their nets, the whole deal, and follow him. That's remarkable. I love that. And so it begins this journey, crisscrossing Palestine, uh, and, and Jesus offers glimpses of what the kingdom looks like. Here, I'm oh, sorry, that's calling of those guys, sorry, I'm behind. Here we see Jesus demonstrating the power of the kingdom of God, and he cleanses Aleppo. Now, ordinary, ordinarily, you know, if you come into contact, and we all know this through COVID, you come into contact with someone with leprosy, usually you get leprosy. <laughs> but the exact opposite happens. No, Jesus doesn't not only not get leprosy, he cleanses the leper completely. Such is the demonstration of the power of this kingdom. And Jesus or Mark wants to really show that in this uh, little scene. News of these miracles are spreading like wildfire throughout the whole region. But Jesus slips away and seems to have another agenda. He tells them, don't tell anyone about what you see. <laughs> he tells the leper, don't go and offer a sacrifice, show what I've done. But no, instead, what's he do? He tells everybody what's happened, as you would, <laughs> especially if you've got loose lips. And not only is Jesus exercising, of course, <clears throat> authority over people's lives, he's demonstrating that in his teaching in the synagogue. They are saying that his teaching has the authority of God, and it's like a new teaching. They've never heard anything like it. It's incredible. He's talking about the kingdom. And Mark brings us now to a scene where Jesus' agenda becomes a little bit clearer. Well, a lot clearer for me. Now, this should be obvious to the reader, but I don't know how astute you are in reading the Gospels, but, you know, fast-paced Mark, you know, it's bang, bang, bang. He's with it. He doesn't mess around with verses. Well, he slows the whole narrative down, and we get 12 verses for this one scene. Everything else gets about three or four, but no, he wants us to see something. And so watch that in the narrative. He slows it right down, and we see that as Jesus' death as well. And it's like an eternity for Mark, the fast-paced gospel writer, because he wants us to see the main purpose of the kingdom of God. Because forgiveness is the main agenda. And Jesus is going to demonstrate this right here. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word. Some men came bringing to him a paralysed man carried by four of them. Since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above, the, above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Can you imagine that scene? Come on. Use your imagination this morning. I know it's Sunday, 10, 10 35, whatever. But can you imagine yourself sitting in that meeting and suddenly there's some debris starts falling on your head? What's that? What's going on? There's a hand scratching up there. 
making a hole. Next thing is bang, there's a leg that comes through. There's, there's stuff falling everywhere. You know, a couple of minutes later, there's such a big hole in the roof. This is what's happening right in front of Jesus preaching here, <laughs> and they're dropping him in front of him. And they lowered this mat, you know, and tip it to the side. I can imagine it. Poor guy's hanging on for dear life, like a like a raft or something. And he gets lowered down right in front of him. And, and Jesus, you know, says something bizarre, just so strange. And it's a bit weird. Look what he says. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> now, I don't know about you. I mean, these were good friends. They went to all the trouble of getting him there. They might have been just a bit disappointed, don't you think? Really? Because they hadn't come to all that trouble. They hadn't gone all these lengths to have his sins forgiven. I mean, please, Jesus, we wanted him to walk. That's why we brought him here. <laughs> but Jesus sees beyond the need for him to walk. Are you kidding me? Hang on a minute. A greater need than being able to walk when you're paralysed? Come on. You must be joking, Jesus. Seriously? It doesn't make sense. A greater need than that? Yes. A much greater need. And just as Jesus looks beyond the paralytic's huge problem. I mean, he can't walk. He's got to have people carrying him everywhere. No electric wheelchairs back then. But just like he looks beyond that problem, he does so for us. He looks beyond our financial problems. He looks beyond our relational problems and even our health problems. As significant and as real and as pressing as they are, Jesus looks beyond them to our greatest problem, our sin problem. Oh, yeah. Although we don't think that's our greatest problem. Lord, don't you care? I'm sick. Please. <laughs> I'm paralyzed. It's a big need. I haven't got any money, Lord. I mean, really. Oh, my, my relationship's breaking down. My, my kid, my, I could go on all day, couldn't I? Because no matter how great this kingdom is, how extraordinary this kingdom of God is, We don't have our sins forgiven. We haven't got a chance to get into it. Not a chance. It's like rocking up to that boarding gate without a ticket. Can you imagine it? <laughs> oh, where's your ticket, Mr. Callahan? I haven't got, a, I haven't got one. Can I get on? <laughs> I can't think so. Sorry, mate. <laughs> Gotta go and buy a ticket back. back. No, no chance. That's exactly the situation. And Jesus wants to make that clear. And Jesus' strange comment produces one of those questions in Mark's Gospel that leads us to see who Jesus is and why he has come. And the teachers of the law are only thinking this. What do they think? Well, they're thinking out loud as far as Jesus is concerned. Now, some of the teachers of the law are sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? As I said, Mark structured his gospel around the questions. Some from others, even some from demons, as we read. And some that he'll ask himself at the end of the gospel. I mean, Jesus is declaring the kingdom of God. People get healed everywhere. The whole region's heard about Jesus. 
He goes into a packed room. Religious leaders, all kinds of people, and he's forgiving sins. And the question that the rulers ask is a legitimate and critical question. And they are 100% right in saying that only God can forgive sins. 100%. And Jesus says, I'll fix that problem because I can forgive sins. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say? Uh, which is easier, to say to this paralysed man, your <clears throat> sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I'll tell you, get up, take up your mat and go. You see, it's easy to say sins are forgiven. You can't see that, can you? Oh, your sins are forgiven. You can't see it. So Jesus heals the paralytic and he says, get up and walk. Everyone can see that. He does that to prove that he can forgive sins. That's what he does it for. Not to show off his power, but to prove that he can forgive sins. And you know that picture of the kingdom of God that's slowly being developed? Well, it's just exploded. It's just gone bam in front of their eyes. It's in full living colour as that man gets out of his mat and starts walking for the first time. And here in Mark's Gospel, we have a developed picture of the kingdom, a foretaste, if you like, of what's going to be that end result at the end of Mark's Gospel when Jesus goes to the cross and dies for the sins of everyone. Not just that paralytic, but for every person that ever breathed a breath of air. And Jesus will go around, and we haven't got time to look at it, and continue to heal and deliver people from demons, showing the picture, a developed picture of what the kingdom looks like, and he causes a running battle with the, the religious rulers and the leaders. Because the Pharisees reckon they know what the composition, I guess, of the kingdom should look like. They think the kingdom should be made up of people who are good, or at least people who think they're good. Those who are law-abiding, those who have a religious heritage, those who think they deserve to be in the kingdom of God. And Jesus wants to show them that they've got it all wrong and they don't understand what the nature of the composition of the kingdom will look like. That's point three, the composition of the kingdom. So there's a big man, get a bit behind when the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. So who is Jesus looking for? Who is he looking for? The good? Or those who think they're good, the religious. Nice, good with the sinners. Sinners like Levi in that picture, Matthew. Sinners like you and me. Those who aren't confident in their own goodness. Those who aren't confident in their religious uh, badge. Well, I'm a Baptist, I'm an Anglican, I'm a minister. I'm a member, I'm a deacon, I'm a, the list goes on. No, those who know they need forgiveness of their sins. Those who know they have a deep need, a greater problem than their 
their physical needs, their financial needs, their relational needs. Jesus is looking for those who we mentioned last week who feel like they need to repent and put their trust in Jesus. And if we had time, we'd see how Jesus had this running conflict with the religious leaders over Sabbath regulations, over fasting, over all these external things that don't matter one whit when it comes to getting into the kingdom and they don't understand it, they don't get it at all. They haven't got a clue. They think it's all about that and it's not. And right early in Mark's gospel, Jesus wants to demonstrate that the kingdom of God is all about forgiveness. It's a central theme. And it's only those who have recognised that they need forgiveness that's going to enter. It's all about realising that you have a sin problem and you need the forgiveness of God through believing in Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm preaching the gospel. And that you need to be cleansed like a leper. And you need to come to Jesus like a paralytic to have his sins forgiven. And it's a remarkable picture of the kingdom of God, folks. And it's enough of a picture today to show us that this is an extraordinary kingdom and one that you can only gain entry through Christ, through Jesus, no other way. See how brilliant Mark is in his explanation, in his demonstration through these scenes of what the kingdom of God's all about. And you know what? There's enough here to see that forgiveness is central to the kingdom. And it's blown away all preconceived ideas of who should be in that kingdom. Oh, no. It's going to be people like that, tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, you name them. Drug dealers. Mums and dads. Nurses. (laughs) Factory workers. Soldiers. Carers. I could go on around this room, couldn't I? Guys on demolition. People who've recognised they need the forgiveness of God through Jesus. That's who's going to be making up this kingdom. And it's an incredible picture. I wonder where you see yourself today. Maybe in all honesty, you might fit in with the Jewish leaders who just might think that they're all right with God by their good deeds, observance of the law, church attendance, and they're assured of the kingdom. Might be confident that you've done enough to earn God's salvation, earn his grace, earn the entrance to the kingdom, surely. After all these years of doing all these good things, yeah. Or on the other hand, you might be wondering why Jesus hasn't paid attention to your agenda, your needs, your health, your finances, or whatever you think is your greatest need. And you might be thinking in the back of your mind, I don't know if there's anything in this Christianity stuff for me. Or maybe you're like one of those people who are in the crowd there in the background who are interested and intrigued by Jesus. But you're just not quite on board with that forgiveness of sin and repentance stuff. Maybe you're not yet seeing how extraordinary this kingdom is and how amazing Jesus really is to bring this kingdom in so that we can enter. And you just have a couple of terms with asking Jesus to forgive your sins so that you can enter that kingdom. I don't know where you're at. You put yourself wherever that 
fits in that picture. But for that last category, I hope that you change your mind and that second category. And that you see that Jesus is interested in your greatest need, the forgiveness of sins. And the greatest thing that can ever happen to your life, no, it's not win the lottery. <laughs> Three billion I saw it last week in America, ridiculous, huh? <laughs> no, not get that great job, not get that prom promotion, not get married even. Not have kids even, not all these things set up for a time and blah, 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 I could go on. No, that your greatest need is to have your sins forgiven and for you to enter into that kingdom where Jesus might say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Come in and gone. And I hope you change your mind if you think otherwise, folks. Because life isn't all about that. As we've got there on the bottom of that little slogan, one life, what's it all about? It's all about Jesus. It's all about coming into the kingdom. It's all about seeing this and being willing to humble yourself before God and come in. Through faith in Jesus, that's the greatest thing. If I can leave you with that today, if I can leave this church, <laughs> and you grasp that today, then, oh man, I'm praising God. Because that's your greatest need and that's the most important thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for Mark's gospel, just how it shows us that picture of the kingdom that is developed. And that you, Jesus, Although seemingly go past some of our other needs, you have made a way for our greatest need to be met, the forgiveness of our sins. We give you praise that you died for our sins. If you're watching today or you're listening, I want to give you an opportunity now to ask Jesus to forgive your sins, for you to realise that that is your greatest need. No matter how real those other needs are, this is your greatest need. And that you will come into the kingdom and come into a relationship with God, which is just awesome and extraordinary, life changing. And if that's you today, please contact me. Please put your hand up if you're here and that's you. Or you're feeling that, hey, Jesus doesn't care. Re re Recommit yourself to him because he loves you and God.